Welcome back to Decouple. Today, I am rejoined by James Krellenstein, who many of you must be now quite familiar with after uh, our uh, recent three episodes, um, which have garnered a lot of praise. Um, so, James, uh, I won't burden you with another self-introduction. Um, you're well known around these parts. Welcome back to Decouple. Thank you for having me back. So, James, um, today we, we've been planning a pretty exciting episode um, on the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, and I think um, for the non-nerds out there, uh, I'm going to try and make it a little more exciting by posing kind of a hypothetical situation. And you tell me kind of how bad that would be. You ready? Rock on. Okay. Okay. So I think um, those of us who have been paying attention, obviously the uranium space is going bonkers uh, because um, there's you know good news for uranium investors. But um, the more savvy will certainly be aware um, that there is uh, some vulnerability in terms of a uh, part of that uranium fuel cycle, which is, of course, the enrichment phase. Um, so I want us to all imagine a Russian embargo on the export of enriched fuel. Um, and I want you to walk me through um, what that would mean. Um, I guess we'll focus on the USA here. Um, how long that would take to bite um, and whether we'd have time to uh, to deal with that. And then I think we'll dive a little bit more into uh, describing this this fantastic topic, getting into some really interesting history, some Soviet kidnapping of German scientists. I won't give away too many teasers. So take it away with that hypothetical situation, James. So, you know, we should just start by saying right now, the United States relies heavily on Russia for its enriched uranium. Right now, every single nuclear power plant in the United States, uh, unlike you people, you folks up north who have these nice heavy water reactors that can use unenriched uranium, we require our nuclear power plants just to, for the reactors to go critical. The uranium that gets put in them needs to be enriched. So, you know, uh, the, the basic story here is this. Let me go back. So right now, every, you know, U.S. nuclear power plant, the reactor inside of those plants requires enriched uranium to work. And what does that mean? That means that we raise up relatively the concentration of uranium-235 higher than it is normally out of natural uh, uranium, uh, which is at 0.7% when it comes out of the ground. And generally inside U.S. nuclear power plants, we are at 3% to around 4.95% uranium-235. The problem is, is that right now the United States does not have enough capacity to enrich all the fuel it needs each year to refuel those nuclear power plants. And in fact, the rest of the world in total relies on Russia to provide that fuel. Right now, about one in 20 American homes and businesses, you know, roughly speaking here and sort of averaging it out, are dependent on Russian fuel right? Russian enrichment services in order to basically keep the lights on. Right now, that is how dependent the United States is. It varies between each year, but every year, about 20 to 30 percent of the enrichment services that the U.S. needs to refuel its nuclear power plants are depend are come from Russia. And that means that in the hypothetical scenario that you just depicted, in which Russia all of a sudden, you know, our friend Vladimir Putin decides to, say, embargo uh, the United States, you know, no longer ship us those enrichment services, we would have a very big problem on our hands. Now, if he just put out the United States and let other countries that require, including U.S. allies, that require uh, enrichment services, there's very likely what we could do is we could sort of play an accounting game and start basically those countries would have to use more Russian fuel and we would sort of take up the domestic enrichment services, that uh, the enrichment services that are taken out, that are providing those countries and use them to basically fuel our plants. But in a world in which the United States and say the European Union get boycotted or, you know, that the Russians no longer will sell enrichment services to those countries, we would be in a pretty big problem. Now, the lights wouldn't go out immediately, right? We have a lot of both, you know, an average nuclear power plant only takes about 18 to 24 months before it gets refueled in the first place. And we have stockpiled 
um, you know, your enriched uranium hexafluoride and also fabricated uranium fuel assemblies and pellets that are ready to go. But it would be, it would require an immediate response in order to build that enrichment capacity to replace the Russians. Right now, the world does not have enough enrichment capacity, speaking globally, to be able to refuel its nuclear reactors without Russia. Even excluding Russian and Chinese domestic demand, the world is highly dependent on Russia to basically refuel its nuclear power plants. And this comes out of, as you were sort of intimating at the beginning of the, uh, of the segment, comes out of some historical accidents that actually go back to the history of World War II, um, and then compounded by a lot of, if we might be frank, on the United States' side, a lot of serious errors by the United States government in how it handled the enrichment uh, space, particularly after World War, uh, after the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the USSR in 1991. So before we get into all that, um, let's uh, provide a little more background. Um, First off, um, I think it's 46% of the world's enrichment is occurring in Russia, 12% in China. Where else is it happening? I'm just going to give you some kind of rapid fire questions to, to get some things out of the way here. So right now, the rest of it, if you bring up China and Russia, right, 46% is Russia, 12% is China. The rest is basically three European countries, believe it or not, the United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, four, four, four European countries, excuse me, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, believe it or not, still enriches a lot of uranium, and the Netherlands. And three out of those four countries, that is Germany, the United Kingdom, and Netherlands, they have a big company called Urenco that is owned by the British and Dutch government and owned by two German utilities. And they basically provide, they're the next biggest enricher after the Russians. And then the French themselves have their own, um, you know, uranium fuel company called Orano. And they have a very big enrichment complex in Tricastin um, called the George Best Du facility uh, that is a centrifuge-based facility. And then Urenco also has a pretty big facility here in the United States in Eunice, New Mexico, called the National Enrichment Facility. Um, Ironically, that facility is owned by the majority by the Dutch and uh, British governments and by some German utilities, but it is in New Mexico. And that's the only source that the United States right now has of domestic uranium enrichment capability. That facility, and we'll talk about this unit later, produces on average around 5.4 million separative work units of enrichment capacity. That's about one third of the 15 million separative work units the United States needs to uh, procure each year of enrichment services to refuel its nuclear fleet of 92 or 93 reactors now. Maybe 94. I might be kidding. <laughs> okay. So um, walk me through again. We'll try and do this kind of rapid fire, but walk me through um, the beginning of the uranium fuel cycle. We mine the ore, we mill it. We turn it into gas. I mean, it, I'm not familiar with all this stuff because I'm up here in Kandu land. We don't have to do none of this uh, uranium well, hexafluoride we'll stuff. Some of this stuff. You got a mill, man. We got a mill, gotta, but you know, we, we don't pass mill, gas. We got to purify, right? So what we do is is we take the uranium out of the ground, and maybe likely that's Canada, Canadian ground, maybe Australian ground, maybe Kazakhstani ground, right? And we take that uranium and we mill it. Um, we, we sort of grind up, obviously, the ore that we're taking out of the ground, and we go through some chemical purification steps to purify the uranium from whatever else is in that ore body that we're taking out. And we generally get out of that product a product that is commonly known as yellow cake. Um, we generally assume it's one molecular compound, but it's actually sort of a species of chemical compounds. And then in Canada land, right, or maybe in Romania and some South Korean, you know, land, we, we that's kind of, we purify it further. Maybe we make it into uranium dioxide. I believe can do pellets of uranium dioxide. And that's the end of it. We put the pellets into these, you know, bundles that look like fire logs, and then you pop it into your heavy water reactors. And that's the end of the story, at least on the front end. But here in the United States and the rest of the civilized world, you know, what we really do here is we have to, because our reactors are not heavy water reactors, we need to enrich it. And that enrichment process first requires a step called conversion. And what conversion is, is the conversion of that yellow cake uranium 
uh, into a compound called uranium hexafluoride. That's UF6, right? One uranium atom and six fluorine atoms uh, per molecule. And what's cool about uranium hexafluoride is that at a very low temperature, it sublimes into gas. And that gaseous process is what we use to enrich uranium. Now, when we, ha we have to understand, in order to understand why enrichment is so difficult, we need to understand the what an isotope is and why that's different from the normal purification processes and, you know, sort of processes that we have every day in everyday life that make modern society go and make all sorts of different manufactured products, especially when we're taking on something out of the ground. Um, and so I, I'm going to just dive right in there. Right. And so what an isotope is, so uranium is a uh, element um, uh, that has generally, let's go back to some basic some basic chemistry 101. When we generally are doing any sort of manufacturing process for something that we take out of the ground, we generally utilize chemical processes to take whatever we uh, take out of the ground, purify it, transform it into the things that we want. So for example, if we were making some chlorine-based product, well, we'll take sodium chloride, your know, salt, out of the ground, and we'll do some chemical processes, maybe some electrochemistry, to basically separate that chlorine ion from the sodium ions. And then we'll, we'll maybe make sodium hypochlorite, which is commonly known as bleach, right? And what we're doing there is we're exploiting the different chemical properties that different elements have. The problem is, is that isotopes, by definition, are different versions of the same element. What does that mean? Well, elements are actually defined by the number of protons that are in a nuclei. We call that the atomic number, right? So uranium, all different isotopes of uranium have 92 protons. And when we're talking about chemistry, what we're actually talking about is we're exploiting differences in the electrons that surround the nuclei, the different properties that the electrons have. So different elements have different chemical properties because they have different electron configurations. And generally, the, the protons are positively charged. And in an unionized element, right, that is the, an element that has no charge, you know, a compound that has no charge, the number of electrons are perfectly balanced by the number of protons. So in a uranium atom, no matter what isotope it is, there'll be 92 protons. And if that uranium atom is unionized, there'll be 92 electrons surrounding that uranium nucleus. But an isotope, what an isotope is, is it's, this, it's a version of an element, so it has the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. And here's the problem. Neutrons, by the, as their name implies, are neutrally charged. They have no net charge per neutron. So that means that in a different isotope, right, the electron configuration that surrounds that nuclei is going to be identical. In other words, uranium-235, which is in a non-fast reactor, really the only fissionable isotope that occurs in naturally occurring uranium, that has the identical chemical properties as uranium-238, which is the vast majority of the uranium that you naturally find in the ground, and in a non-fast reactor, again, is generally not fissionable. So here's the problem. We have, and remember, 99.2% of uranium, when you take it out of the ground, a little bit more than 99.2, almost 99.3% of the uranium that's in the ground is that uranium-238 isotope. Only about 0.71% in a naturally occurring uranium that goes into can-do reactors or comes out of the ground is uranium-235. But the chemical properties between 235 and 238 are identical. So how do we separate them out? And that is what the process of enrichment is. And it's very, very different than almost any other process that we use in manufacturing today, at least from, you know, ore purification or chemical. It's very distinct from chemical purification because they have the same chemical properties. Does that make sense? I know that's a lot to digest in a, in a single, you know, segment, but I'm trying to understand the, the basic science behind it. Yeah. We're good. So how do we separate this? Well, here's the thing. 
Neutrons have no charge, but they have a lot of mass. They're, you know, about as heavy as a proton is. And that means that a uranium-235 atom is slightly lighter than a uranium-238 atom. And in fact, that difference is, you know, is actually at three atomic mass units between the 235 and 238. So what we can do is we can almost all, all commercially, you know, commercially deployed uranium enrichment technologies today utilize that difference in mass between the lighter 235 and 238 to basically separate them out. So how do we do that? Well, commercially, um, and we're ignoring some of the early sort of experiments that were done in the Manhattan Project, like Caltrons and electromagnetic separation. Generally, commercially, we do two different processes. And actually, right now, we only do one. We, there's the first process that was really done in the beginning of the Manhattan Project, primarily, or actually at the middle of the Manhattan Project, uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab at K25, was a process called gaseous diffusion. What is gaseous diffusion? Well, as you said, remember you said we're converting this uranium. Why, the, why are we putting it uranium, the heaviest naturally occurring um, uh, element? Why are we putting it into a gas? We don't generally think of uranium as a gas. Well, there's a property um, in physics called and chemistry called diffusion. Um, and diffusion were, were, you know, is basically the way that sort of molecules in a gas or in a liquid sort of move around each other. And if we put a, if we basically take a, you know, a segment of uranium gas, this uranium hexafluoride gas, and we separate it by a membrane that is what we call semi-permeable, that allows some of the gas to diffuse, but it doesn't allow it all to do at once, right? There's some time that it takes to separate between, between it. Think about it like, you know, uh, you know, a piece of filter paper or a saran wrap or something. It allows the water to slowly diffuse or the gas to slowly diffuse not all at once, there's a property, it's called Fick's Law, which basically says that the lighter sort of species, the lighter molecules will diffuse slightly faster than the heavier ones. And so what we do in gaseous diffusion is we take these massive cascades of these semi-permeable membranes called diffusers, we pump in the gas, we put some pressure on that gas, and we basically slowly allow that uranium hexafluoride gas to diffuse through the semi-permeable membrane. And by this fixed law property, the slightly lighter isotope, uranium, the uranium hexafluoride molecule with the uranium-235 atom in it, will diffuse slightly faster than the uranium-238. And as if we do this over and over and over again in thousands of cascades, we will slowly begin increasing the relative concentration of uranium-235 at each step. And we take away what we call the tails of, of the segment that's sort of left over on the other side of that partition that has going to have relatively more uranium-238. So we can repeat that process over and over again in thousands of cascades, right, to basically raise up that process of uranium-235. So that is how gaseous diffusion works. Now, what are the downsides to gaseous? Do you want to ask a question there? Just to keep to... it more entertaining. Um, I heard that. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's I, all good. It's, it's, detail. No, no, it's all, it's all good. But just to kind of have the back and forth. Um, I did hear that. Was it 7% of all U.S. grid electricity was being consumed at one point by, was it just Oak Ridge's or a couple of these gas diffusion plants? Oh, so, right. We built uh, a, um, a huge number, both for civilian nuclear power in the United States and for the nuclear weapons program. We built a huge amount of gaseous diffusion enrichment capacity. And one of the problems that we have about this diffusion process and this diffusers is that we got to take compressors at each sex and basically recompress the gas and cool it and heat it at each different time. And that takes a massive amount of power. And we built three large gaseous diffusion plants in the United States. Right, we built one in Oak Ridge National Lab, which is K25. We built another one in Paducah, Kentucky, and another one in Piketon, Ohio. And at one point in the 1950s, these takes each one of these plants takes like 3,000 megawatts, and if they're bigger, they take a little more power of it. Right, uh, they took a sizable percentage 
I believe it was close to 5 to 7% in the mid-50s of the total amount of electric power that was produced in those years was being dedicated to the uranium enrichment process because it just took so much electricity. And these, these plants were running 24-7, right? And then just as a reminder to, to those um, you know, few listeners who you know, are not up with what a megawatt means, I mean, that's like a city of 3 million people, um, each of these. Is so literally, there are massive coal power plants at that time that were built to fuel these gaseous diffusion plants. In, um, in um, France, at that Tricastin facility, before they built their current gas centrifuge facility, they actually built four nuclear power plants, uh, four reactors at one nuclear power plant, each of 900 megawatts, to feed that massive gaseous diffusion plant so that the French could be literally all uranium powered. And so this gaseous diffusion process, it's pretty, it's relatively simple compared to the other techniques that we utilize, but it takes this massive amount of energy. Now there's another process. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and, to, keep, and to keep it narrative here, maybe we can work in, um, yeah, that other process and, and how it came to be. Sorry for the disruption, jump on in. Yeah, no, I was about to go into that. Ah. The other process is a pr- process called gas centrifuges. And what gas centrifuges are, or as their name are, they're centrifuges, right, that are a big spinning, ro- you know, basically rotor assembly that goes at thousands of rotations per minute that spins the gas. And the heavier molecules of it, of the gas, like a regular centrifuge, like in your washing machine or if you've ever worked in a chemistry or bio lab, right, the heavier stuff will go to the outside and the lighter stuff will go into the in- mid- middle. So what that allows us to do is the lighter uranium hexafluoride gas goes in the middle of the centrifuge and the heavier uh, uranium uh, hexafluoride, which is the 238, goes to the ends of the edges of the centrifuges. And we could use this process in a series, once again, to separate the lighter uranium 235 from the heavier uranium 238. Here's the problem. That all sounds really, really good. But the mechanical engineering of building a gas centrifuge is extremely, extremely complicated. And in fact, it was so complicated that even though the Manhattan Project tried to build a uranium uh, hexafluoride gas centrifuge, they actually abandoned it uh, midway in that program because it was just too challenging. And in sort of an American way, we just decided, ah, we're just going to do this sort of stupid, big, really, really like the Hummer of uranium enrichment. We're just going to build the massive coal power plants at K25. And we're just going to basically feed in a huge amount of energy to basically build that uranium enrichment process. Now, there was a team at this time that was working on a gas centrifuge and made a couple of very big innovations. Unfortunately, they were not on what we generally think of as the good side in World War II. There there was a Nazi nuclear weapons program and a Nazi uranium program uh, in Germany, of course, uh, during World War II. It wasn't a particularly advanced program. But one of the things that they actually did get very well, very good at is building gas centrifuges. And it turned out that... (laughs) They made a couple of major mechanical engineering breakthroughs during the Nazi period. And most importantly, in some ways, they had a really, really good group of scientists and engineers uh, who were working on this problem. And unfortunately, well, depending on what your perspective, fortunately or unfortunately, depending if you're Russian or American, the Soviet forces got to that team before the American or British or French forces did. And that meant that the Soviets being entrepreneurial people, well, not classically, but, you know, in a communist sort of way, (laughs) uh, sort of kidnapped that team and kept them as prisoners of war and and put them up in a very nice prison camp, I believe, on the Black Sea. Um, It was still a prison camp, but as, you know, gulags go, it was a pretty damn nice gulag. And they were dedicated to basically build out a gas centrifuge program for the USSR for the Soviets, for the communists. And they began making very serious technical innovations within this prison camp. And by the 1950s, by the early 1950s, we actually had some prototype gas centrifuges in the Soviet Union. And by about 1960 or 1961, we had commercial 
so, uh, Soviet gas centrifuge programs while the United States was building these massive, massive gaseous diffusion plants in um, Paducah, Kentucky, and in Piketon, Ohio. Um, and as well as the Europeans who were building this were also beginning to build uh, a uh, gaseous diffusion programs as well. So the Soviets began getting an edge in the uranium enrichment uh, space. Now, at the time, actually, the United States and the West did not really appreciate how much ahead the Soviets were in gas centrifuge development. There wasn't very much trade at this point, especially in uranium between the United States and the West and the, the USSR. In fact, actually, it's considered one of the largest intelligence failures in U.S. history that the extent and the advancement of the gas centrifuge program in the USSR was not established, basically was not understood until the eve of the collapse of the USSR decades later. So we assumed, and the Soviets built a very large gaseous diffusion plant. They love redundancy there. They were both building gaseous diffusion plants and gas centrifuge plants. But by the 60s and 70s and 80s, they were more and more building out their gas centrifuge program while the gaseous diffusion program was slowly uh, being left for obsolescence. Now, one of these, so, one of these si German scientists who had been uh, sort of imprisoned, a guy named Zip, basically was allowed, after Stalin died in 1954, he was allowed to go back to the West. I mean, which is kind of crazy, yeah. in my opinion. You know, for good old Nikita to basically allow this guy to come back. And he did not apparently realize, uh, so the apocryphal story goes, how much uh, behind the West was until he was at a conference in Amsterdam. And then was recruited basically back to the University of Virginia in the United States to work on early prototypes of the gas centrifuge. And... The Americans, for whatever reason, and we can talk about this, weren't particularly interested in Zip's work, although actually we began a gas centrifuge program a couple of years later in the 1960s. So Zip went over to Europe, back into the Netherlands, and started building gas centrifuges for Urenco. And that began, we began seeing the first commercial gas centrifuges in Western Europe in the 1970s. But the Americans really weren't doing that. They were keeping on operating their old uh, sort of gaseous diffusion plants. Now, there's a wrinkle in this story that we'll get to, but I want to pause there and sort of take a breather and see what, what you yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, for that. sure. So, I mean, it is interesting. You know, my mind is going in all different kind of places, but one of them is, uh, you know, Sova Cool studies on life cycle emissions of nuclear and the ways in which I think you know, accounting for gaseous diffusion can really increase the life cycle carbon impacts of nuclear versus versus the centrifuge program. And you mentioned, you know, three massive or four massive coal plants for one diffusion plant in the U.S. What's the kind of energy requirement? How, how does that compare uh, between gaseous so diffusion I'll and centrifuge? I'll give you an example, right? It's a great question. When, you know, I talked about this, uh, this great kind of uranium facility in in France, in, in Tricastin, I believe it's in the Rhone Valley. Very verdant, very beautiful. You know, I think there are vineyards surrounding it. Uh, but they built, as I said, four of these 900 megawatt electrical each reactors there at that to basically feed that uh, gaseous diffusion facility. When they shut down that facility, it was called Eurodiff. Uh, when they shut down that facility, they replaced it with a gas centrifuge facility. And that facility took... Three thousand, like roughly the entire output plus one reactor for redundancy, basically of those three nuclear reactors running at full power to run that gaseous diffusion plant. When they replaced it with a slightly smaller, but not very much smaller facility, that 3,000 megawatt load dropped to 80 megawatts, right? So literally gas centrifugation is between 20 to 50 fold less energy intention, intensive per unit of enrichment than gaseous diffusion is. So this is beyond more than an order of magnitude more efficient. And therefore, the French got a couple thousand megawatts all of a sudden free, and they're still getting the same amount of enrichment, well, slightly less. But, you know, it's a really, it just gives you an idea of how much dramatic that, 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 um, 
that uh, gas center how much dramatically more efficient gas centrifugation is gaseous okay an- another another random question i think mark nelson posted on this but just talking about the energy return and energy invested of um, enriching uranium. Do you, do you have any idea what that is? Uh, you know, I wish I actually knew that exact number. It is very, very, very high. I can, uh, um, I can probably do the math pretty quickly in my head. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, especially with, um, with a gas centrifuge-based program, um, the, uh, you know, energy return on investment is almost certainly likely going to be on the order of 60 times to 70 times, right. When we're doing, um, you know, uh, um, centrifuge based enrichment. Now that's including actually, uh, also including the energy that's needed for mining and milling, for the conversion, for the fuel fabrication, for the construction of the plant, operational plant, decommissioning, fuel storage. So the idea, you know, I think the ERI or the energy return on investment, so for listeners who don't know, this is how much energy you need to put into a nuclear power plant, to the enrichment process, to the mining, and how much energy do you get back? And we say, well, take the energy you got back, divide it by the energy you put in, and that's your energy return on investment. And nuclear power, I think, has one of the highest energy return on investment by a lot compared to almost any energy source. And we, we bumped it up a lot when we uh, went to um, from gaseous diffusion enrichment to gas centrifuge-based enrichment. Um, but to be honest, uranium enrichment, it's still, yeah, it's a lot of power, but you're producing, you know, that 3,000 megawatts or 2,000 megawatts that that facility in France was, I believe it was actually 2,000 megawatts, um, that was, you know, basically powering all of France. Right. <laughs> Roughly speaking. So even if it seems like a lot, 2000 megawatts, that's a lot. But now we have an 80 to 100 megawatt facility that's powering all of France for the enrichment stuff. So even though enrichment takes maybe a lot of power, especially when using gaseous diffusion, compared to the amount of energy you're getting back out, it's just not comparable. Tell me then about this, because uh, it seems important um, in terms of just uh, quantifying um, you know, how much uh, separative work units, and that's the term I want you to define, we're, we're going to need to replace uh, dependence on Russian uranium in the U.S., for instance. So what's the SWU, what's that referring to? Is it a unit of oh, a energy? A work or? unit or a SWU, as, as you just call it. We call them SWU, but it's S-W-U, and it stands for uh, separative work unit. It's a really complicated unit to understand. Um, and because that's because the actual amount, you know, what we care about is, well, how much enrichment work does it take um, to basically, uh, um, how do you want to say it? How much enrichment work does it take to get a pound of uranium end product or a kilogram of uranium product at the end, at the enrichment level that we need? And it turns out that's actually dependent on a couple of different factors. How many SWU do you need to get a kilogram of uranium, let's say at 4.95% uranium-235? Well, that's going to be dependent on a couple of big input variables, right? The first input variable is going to be what the natural, what we call the feed assay is. So that's just natural uranium coming out of the ground. That's going to be 0.711%. But it's also going to be dependent on what we call the tails assay, which is basically the amount of uranium-235 that's left after the enrichment process is done, right? When we're enriching, right, we have some, you know, end uranium product that has a certain percentage of uranium-235. We have a tails assay, right, which gives the amount of waste uranium that is most of the uranium-238, but there's still a little bit of uranium-235. And depending on what those variables are, you know, really determines how much SWU you need. Now, generally, what we assume for SWU, and I'm not going to define SWU. The SWU is actually mathematically very, very difficult to define, right? But generally, the way that we think about this, the general numbers that we utilize is we assume that we feed it with natural uranium at 0.7% uranium-235, right? We have a tail, we have a product assay of 4.95% uranium-235, so the upper end of what lower enriched uranium is, and we leave about 0.23% uranium-235 in the tails. And that means that we need about 8 SWU, kilogram SWU, or 8.1, 8.2 SWU per kilogram of uranium end product at 
Now, in order to get that one kilo of uranium at 4.95%, uranium-235, we need about 10 kilograms of natural uranium inputted in to the system. Um, let's bring in lasers and megatons to megawatts as a bit of an explainer again of, of how the U.S. has gotten to where it is now, um, where its enrichment capacity is insufficient to meet its needs. So let's go back to the, the 1970s. So Zip is out of the Soviet Union in the 50s. He's a member of this team that's building these gas centrifuges. He goes to the University of Virginia Right, he begins building some gas centrifuges. The U.S. is sort of interested in this. Begins a gas centrifuge development program. Zip goes back to Europe and starts building out the Dutch, you know, sort of uranium uh, sort of uh, gas centrifuge supply chains in the Netherlands. But we actually start building a gas centrifuge program here in the United States, and we begin. The United States at that time, all enrichment services was created by a government-owned corporation. What if uh, for my U.S. government fan listeners, what we call a GOCO, right, which is a government owned contractor operated company that the federal government, you know, in the Brits and the Canadians, we call that a crown corporation. But it's basically owned by the state and operated by a private company. And that company called USEC or United States Enrichment Corporation. And they were the ones who were operating these facilities in Paducah and Piketon. And basically they recognize the massive energy efficiency that uh, gains that gas centrifuges had in enrichment over the gas, the massive gaseous diffusion plants we'd built in Paducah and in Piketon. So what did they do? Well, they started building a gas centrifuge program called the GSEP or the Gas Centrifuge Enrichment Plant outside of the old gaseous diffusion plant that was still operating in Ohio, right on those grounds in Piketon, outside of Portsmouth, Ohio. And they literally start developing the American centrifuge, which was the largest at that time center, gas centrifuge that had ever been built. And we started pouring billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars into developing it and building a massive, massive facility uh, in, in Ohio to basically build the first gas centrifuge enrichment plant. In fact, this has more, you know, it's a larger facility by roof area than the Pentagon is just to give you an idea of what, how big we built this. And we, we began prototyping this large gas centrifuge out. And then we began building thousands of these massive centrifuges. They're 50 feet tall and filling them up in this building in, in Ohio. In fact, we built, I believe, close to 1,500 of them and, and had spent billions of dollars building a plant to do it. But in the mid-1980s, a newer technology started attracting the attention of, it, you know, the government bureaucrats at USEC and of the nuclear industry itself. And they said, rather than using this gas centrifuge technology, yeah, we've done it. It's, you know, we got some perfected. You know, the Europeans are starting to use it. The Russians, unbeknownst to them, are really using it. Um, why don't we use lasers to enrich uranium? And the... So they abandoned in the early 1980s this massive facility, which we had spent close to $7 billion on developing the technology, building this plant, and literally building over a 1,000 centrifuges and actually running them in test and demonstration cascades. Why don't we abandon that facility and go to a different technology called atomic vapor laser isotope separation, or AVLIS, right? And... That's because Avalis is really goddamn cool. Um, it's not necessarily, though, commercially that much better. And we should talk about how atomic vapor laser isotope separation works because it doesn't exploit the mass difference between uranium. It does something much, as a physics guy, much, much more cooler than that to basically separate that out if we want to go into that very if you can do it, briefly. if you can do it really briefly, yeah, let's hit it. And then- it's going to be really hard to do it briefly. Shot, <laughs> I know, you know, I know. Like, you can cut this out if it doesn't work. So remember when I was saying that, you know, the electrons that surround the nuclei, right, are basically identical between different isotopes. That is really almost true. But there's one very, very subtle impact that's actually going on. And it's a quantum mechanical property called hyperfine coupling 
What that means is that the nuclei itself has a magnetic field and some electrical field that's associated with it. And that magnetic field and electrical field influences the electrons that are surrounding that nuclei, okay? And that means very, we have very, very subtle, what are called hyperfine shifts in the excitation frequencies of the energy levels of the surrounding electrons that are going. So if you have a very, very, very precise laser, an incredibly narrow laser that is only putting out light at the, the most purest color, you can selectively excite uranium-235 atoms over uranium-238 atoms. So in the Avalis program, what we do is we vaporize pure uranium, not uranium hexafluoride. We reach it to a really, really high temperature. We pick a gas stream of gaseous uranium. We boil the uranium, gasify it, and then irradiate it with this highly, highly precise, very finely tuned uranium, uh, laser light and we selectively photoionize the 235 atoms over the 238 atoms. That actually might be in the reverse. A lot of these details are classified. You might be selectively ionizing the uranium 238 and separating it. And so then that becomes negatively, ch that becomes charged, right? So if you photoionize, you inject an electron. What you do here is you hit it with a photon of laser light that's so precisely tuned, it brings an electron so high to a, such a high energy level, it escapes the sort of pull of the nuclei and ejects out. So all of a sudden, rather than having 92 protons and 92 electrons, you have 92 protons and 91 electrons. And all of a sudden, that uranium atom is, is positively charged, right? It has a net charge on it. And then utilizing a magnetic field, you can essentially separate the charged gases, the charged uranium atoms away from the uncharged, unexcited uh, atoms. And that's really goddamn cool. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're using quantum mechanics. You're using super powerful, super precise lasers. You are um, boiling uranium and gasifying it, right? Then you're using basically like a, a, a uh, essentially a magnetic field or an electrical field to separate the selectively photoionized uranium atoms to enrich uranium. That's a hell of a lot cooler than spinning gas really, really goddamn fast. And nuclear engineers, as I think we've talked about sometimes, and the nuclear industry itself, likes to get distracted by really shiny, really cool physics problems that don't necessarily have that many commercial uh, applications and superiority. Now, some will argue there are some commercial advantages to laser isotope separation. There probably are. So the United States government, though, seeing this technology and seeing some prototype uh, cascades or, or demo projects of, uh, of, of laser isotope separation out in the national labs says, we'll just sort of stop that gas centrifuge enrichment program out in Ohio. We'll kind of abandon that program. We'll start dumping billions of dollars into R and D to basically make atomic vapor laser isotope separation work. Now for a variety of reasons, the technical challenges associated with doing this, surprise, surprise, were a little bit more complicated than were initially anticipated when that decision was made. And we really never got Avalis, even to today, into a commercial development phase. Now, I want to be clear. There is global laser enrichment, and there's a company called Silex, which is now an Australian company that actually has perfected a different laser isotope separation technique that's molecular vapor rather than atomic vapor laser isotope separation. That actually uses uranium hexafluoride to, do, uh, la to use lasers to selectively separate, uh, enrich. But um, I need to be clear that the, uh, the Avalis program which is different from that Silex program, never came to commercial maturity. And so we sort of abandoned that plant, that gas centrifuge plant that we were building in Ohio. We buried those 1,500 centrifuges in the desert, and we just kept on using gaseous diffusion what? to basically enrich the fleet over and over again. Now, what happens is the late 1980s come and go. Avalis is still in the national labs. We're still trying to commercialize it. And then all of a sudden, in 1991, Soviet Union collapses. 
And it's no longer the Soviet Union. It's the Russian Federation and the other constituent republics. And there's two things going on in the Soviet Union, or the former Soviet Union at this point. First of all, the Soviet taxpayers have spent a lot of money building a massive, massive gas centrifuge complex uh, mo at multiple different enrichment facilities, which was much larger than what the Russian nuclear power fleet needed each year to, uh, to facilitate, to basically refuel. And the Russians all of a sudden had a massive stockpile of highly enriched uranium that could hypothetically utilize, be utilized in a bomb, just already enriched, hanging out, sort of waiting for something to be done with it. And these two issues, and now all of a sudden, Russia is no longer the West's immortal enemy. We are basically our friend, their you know, end of history. Francis Fukuyama writes that famous essay. We have this issue. And now all of a sudden, Russians also in a massive economic a sort of recession and really a depression post the Soviet collapse. So there's a lot of concern about the security of these facilities that are storing highly enriched uranium. And so we do two things. The first thing is the Russian companies that took over the state-owned enterprises that owned these uh, enrichment facilities all of a sudden say, hey, you guys need enriched uranium you guys in the America and in the West and in other countries, you guys need enriched uranium. We have a really big centrifuge facilities that, hey, by the way, you know, Soviet taxpayers, kind of communism, we pay for all the capital costs. It's a hell of a lot cheaper than running your gas diffusion plants. Why don't we sell it to you and begin actually selling Russian uranium? And we'll get at a much, much lower price per swoo than uh, you guys can do out of your gas diffusion plant. And then simultaneously, non-proliferation experts and nuclear engineering experts recognizing this massive stockpile of highly enriched uranium, and they want to do something with it. They don't want rogue actors to get, you know, uh, hold of it. They want to basically start, you know, buying that highly enriched uranium and using it in the existing nuclear power fleet. So we begin a program called Megatons to Megawatts. And... The idea of that is we're going to take that highly enriched uranium that is produced, that's sort of sitting around in these various facilities in Russia and also in former Soviet states, and we're going to downblend it. That is, take it, it might be up to 90% uranium-235. We're going to take depleted uranium-238 or natural uranium, downblend it back down to 4 or 5% uranium-235, what we use in civilian reactors, and ship it over to a fuel fabricator to make it into pellets that can go into a, a, uranium, a, a, a nuclear power plant reactor. And this program begins in earnest in the late 90s. And at the peak of its program, 50% of the nuclear fuel in the United States was, was downblended weapons-grade highly enriched uranium from Russia. So that means 10% for the mid 2000s, 10% of the electric power in the United States was basically old Soviet weapons grade uranium that was keeping the lights on here in the United States. I mean, it, and it, what that is, it, yeah, it's, sorry, it's kind of an inspiring story. I mean, it's the ultimate uh, swords to plowshares, but obviously it had, it had some geopolitical implications, which I, I guess we'll get into, but, but carry so, on. You know, I think it's easy to think that, it, you know, one of the things that we're not doing at this time is building our gas centrifuge capacity. We're not replacing the gas diffusion plants. Um, in fact, the gaseous diffusion plants in both Portsmouth and in Paducah, in Kentucky and Ohio, keep on running through the 90s. And at first, we shut down the facility in Ohio in 2001, which was still a gaseous diffusion plant, the Port Portsmouth gas gaseous diffusion enrichment plant. We shut that down. And then in 2013, we shut down the Paducah plant. And that's because megatons to megawatts, no megatons to megawatts, they just can't compete with the gas centrifuge-based um, uh, enrichment programs because they had to spend a massive amount of power, uh, money, excuse me, buying these thousands of megawatts that each one of these plants required to enrich the uranium. Whereas the dainty sort of gas centrifuges were literally taking 20 to 50 times less power per unit enrichment. So I, you know, I want to stand up for megatons to megawatts here because here's what happens. In 1991, 1992, 
We did not have any alternative program in the United States to enrich uranium but gaseous diffusion. We need to build a gas centrifuge program. That Those assets were already uneconomical. And what, what, what megatons to megawatts should have done is given us a nice breather. You know, we're going to downblend this Russian uranium. We're going to build our replacement technology to replace it once, you know, there's an infinite amount, even the Soviets in their sort of, you know, uranium, highly enriched uranium gigamania did not build in a mass, in an infinite amount. We were, we knew we were going to run out of it by 2013, 2014. That would be the end of the program. So we actually had a nice, you know, two decade long gap to not rush to sort of be slow and build the right facilities up. But another factor starts happening here at this point, which is that remember when I said the United States Enrichment Corporation was a GOCO, government-owned, you know, um, uh, 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 contractor-operated facility. Well, in the in the peak of what I like to call neoliberal brain fuck, right? You know, in the, uh, of the 1990s, we had this real idea that always a private-owned enterprise is going to be better than a state-owned enterprise. Um, and we also had the Clinton administration, who was trying to balance their budget um, with the Republicans in Congress. And they needed, some, they needed a couple billion bucks to do this. So the Clinton administration decided to privatize the United States Enrichment Corporation, basically literally take USEC, IPO it, literally introduce it onto the, the, um, U- the New York Stock Exchange and sell that company to the private market. So we privatized in the late 1990s the United States Enrichment Corporation, which was operating these uneconomical gas, center- gas diffusion-based enrichment plants. And we made a couple billion bucks. Actually, the U.S. government made a couple billion bucks by selling it on the market. And a lot, some people, a lot of Democratic economists and Republican economists were very in favor of this. Congress passed a law called the USEC Privatization Act. Now, there's a couple of fringe academics, including Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, who generally opposed this idea, said that some things like uranium enrichment should be kind of controlled by the state and should not be necessarily subject to the whims of the market. And... Joe Stiglitz was sort of ignored, uh, as were some other folks. And we went forward, Congress went forward, President Clinton signed the USEC Privatization Act, and USEC was no longer a government-owned corporation. So what happens now? Well, remember that, that American centrifuge, that American centrifuge that was going on in the 70s and 80s, right, that we built 1,500 of, we built this massive facility in Ohio. All of a sudden, you know, USEC has been spending billions of dollars trying to develop various laser isotope separation techniques, and they kind of fail. They, they can't commercialize them. So all of a sudden, they go back and they recognize, hey, we have a centrifuge technology. Let's start redeveloping the centrifuge technology, build out a supply chain, and start filling that facility out in Ohio, employ hundreds of workers out in Ohio to basically make the American centrifuge plant, the ACP. And they begin doing this. They apply to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a combined construction operating license to build a facility. The NRC, in in, in a year or two, grants that license and says, hey, we're going to build you about a 3.8 million SWU facility, grant you a license to do that. That's more than we import each year from Russia uh, in the uh, uh, the amount of enrichment services. So had that facility actually come online, We would not need to depend on Russia today. But a couple of things happen. First thing in 2008, global financial crisis happens. And all of a sudden, USEC, which is now a private company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, needs to go out to the debt markets to basically finance the building of that facility. At the same time, they're going to go to the loan programs office, where now Jigger offers, and they're going to use a $2 billion loan guarantee to be able to build that facility. The loans program office denies that application, which means that the $2 billion of loans that they need to do all of a sudden are not financeable to basically build and finish that facility, even though they've already spent a couple billion dollars actually building that facility up, building the supply chains to build the thousands of centrifuges that need to go into that facility. 
So that means that all of a sudden, the, ga- the, the American centrifuge plant is demobilized, and they're looking for alternative funding. Then 2011 rounds around, and the Fukushima Daiichi accident occurs. And the global price for separative work for these SWU plummets. So all of a sudden, people are like, there's no commercial market for this product. You can't get any financing. And basically, the product completely de- the project completely demobilized. And, and to what to what degree did the German and sort of the Japanese kind of as quickly as possible shut off all their nuclear plants? The Germans began a pretty uh, crash phase that I understand. There were some other um, politically motivated and maybe economically motivated closures due to cheap nat gas in the U.S. To what degree did that take out demand for enriched fuel? And is that part of the story? It took out, uh, I think it took out a huge amount of demand. Uh, not actually that huge. I mean, the Japanese were a pretty large chunk that went on. We were starting to see shutdowns. In, um, you know, the U.S. a little bit and obviously Germany to a much larger extent. I don't think it's I and mean, we saw the price of separative work on the SWU spot price just drop really dramatically. But I think more psychologically what was going on is that there was a belief in this time that it's kind of the end of nuclear, right? Or that nuclear power is not going to be a growth sector. And, hey, we have still this cheap Russian SWU. And especially in 2011, 2012, we were kind of trying to repair relationships with Russia at this time. The great uh, in the U.S., the Obama administration was trying to do the reset with Russia. And coupled with the fact that we didn't see a, a growth in nuclear power, we saw a lot of shutdown. It's going to be really hard to suddenly motivate, uh, you know, um, to motivate essentially investors to put up that debt financing, especially when there's not an LPO guarantee of that debt. So all of a sudden, what happens is the Department of Energy decides to basically say, you know what, why don't you just build me 160 centrifuges, do some commercial demonstration. The U.S. government will put up a couple hundred million dollars. You'll put up about 80 million dollars, USEC, and build me a couple of demos, you know, 160, a full commercial cascade plus some spares of these centrifuges to demonstrate how well it works, actually, this technology that you're sort of rehabilitating for the 1970s and 1980s. And they do this. They build 160 centrifuges and run it in a cascade and demonstrate and uh, accumulate a couple million man hours, uh, uh, machine hours, excuse me, of demo time on these machines. But then 2015 and 2016 comes around. United, in the meantime, this company, USEC, goes through bankruptcy. It now no longer has any actual enrichment capability because Paducah, Kentucky shuts down. Ohio has already been shut down since 2001. The only thing it does is it basically works as a broker to sell Russian uranium to U.S. nuclear power utilities. And this facility, all of a sudden, we built 160 centrifuges, three quarters of which was paid for by the Department of Energy. All of a sudden, there's no more DOE money coming down. They built this, these centrifuges. They've operated. There's no commercial market for it. It's not big enough. You know, that's not enough centrifuges to make a commercially viable plant. And they decide to decommission and decontaminate that piped in facility. So they take out all of those centrifuges and bury them out in the desert again in, uh, in, in the West. So now we have this massive facility in Piketon, Ohio, that is just, you can see, you know, we built this big report for this. And there was a big New York Times front page story that featured our report that was uh, on the, um, that they actually, the reporters, Max Barrick, went out to Piketon and toured this facility, which is just massive. And you see the holes in the ground in the floor where the centrifuges get placed. And there's just 3,800, if I'm remembering correctly, holes in the, in the ground where all these centrifuges are supposed to go. And we had 160 and they got buried in the desert after we had di- buried a couple, uh, you know, over a thousand, you know, a couple decades earlier. Now what? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, no. I mean, we do need to get to Halu. I, we do need to get to Halu. I, yeah, but, so Halu's but, about but, to come up. Okay. Man. Right. But I also just want, I mean, what you're talking about is so reminiscent of the themes um, we've been exploring um, in terms of nuclear construction and to, in terms of the kind of industrial ADHD of the American nuclear sector. And 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased in terms of, uh, you know, a bit of a warm spot towards some degree of central planning of national strategy, whether it's industrial policy or, you know, very vital industries like uranium enrichment. You know, we're finding ourselves in, in a current conundrum where vulnerable, well, in Canada, we're not, but I'll generously say we, um, to include the USA here, um, are in a real you know, predicament and, and, you know, there's, there's a potential for reputational damage. Nuclear is, should be kind of the ultimate energy security play. And there's a real risk of, of, again, not just reputational damage, but I don't know about the lights going out, but it's a big deal. And we just seem to be politically unequipped to, to meet that challenge and just do a little bit of planning. Um, so yeah, this is a multi-decade long failure of which, you know, the U S taxpayer, has spent billions of dollars ostensibly on defending, uh, on trying to solve this problem, and we just never got anywhere. And and to your exact point, you know, what worries me the most is right now in the United States, right, you are not allowed to import Russian coal. You're not allowed to import Russian oil or Russian refined products. You're not allowed to import Russian natural gas. You know, maybe you're allowed to import Russian wood. I haven't looked at that, but that's a lot of the energy in the world, right? There's one exception to here. We're importing a hell of a lot of Russian uranium and, and Russian enriched uranium, more importantly. Right? Russia does actually mine some uranium, too. In fact, 12% of the uranium that we get, forget about the enrichment sources, come from Russian mines, which is completely unacceptable because you guys in Canada and our friends in Australia have plenty of uranium right, to mine. But regardless, the real problem is we don't have the enrichment services. So right now, nuclear power, I want to say kind of tragically and ironically, is the energy source that the United States is most dependent on Russia for. And as you just said, one of the selling points of nuclear power should be its energy independence. Hey, man, you know, Canada has the world's largest uranium reserves. And we really like the Canadians. I don't know how much you guys like us. But we really like you guys when we think about you. Um, and, then, and then the Australians, we also really like, right? And they have the third largest uranium, proven uranium reserves. So we have a really good energy security situation. Uranium is really tiny. In terms of enrichment, man, this is a facility. This is a factory that we need to build in the United States. And we have one in New Mexico, right? That the that the um that that British Dutch German company Urenco put together. And it's operating at 5.4 million SWU. We had the NRC not only license the American centrifuge plant in Ohio, gave it a full COL. This is not the NRC's fault. The, the NRC basically did its job, said, here, here's a license, build and operate the plant. The NRC licensed multiple other sites to build massive new enrichment facilities. In, Hi- I- in Idaho, we licensed what was then called Ariva, which would now be Orano, the French company, to build a really, really large centrifuge-based enrichment facility out in, in Idaho. In North Carolina, in Wilmington, North Carolina, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission gave a license to a to GE Hitachi, which at, at that point was the majority owner of Global Laser Enrichment, along with Silex, to build a laser-based enrichment facility out in Wilmington. The NRC built a facility, gave a license to that facility that is operating in Urenco, in, that Urenco facility in New Mexico, to basically make 10 million SWU, uh, uh, even though it's only operating at 5.4 million SWU. So the NRC has like given given out. License after license and said, basically, you like from an NRC perspective, guys, go build, build and operate. And if any one of those facilities came online to their uh, license capacity today, we would not be we would not be dependent in Russia for any enrichment services because we take around a couple three to four million, let's say roughly SWU each year from Russia each one of those facilities is bigger than 3 million SWU. Right, right. From what I understand, um, you know, if, if, if a Russian enriched uranium was sanctioned, um, investment, private investment in the sector um, would be difficult because of the relative um, uncompetitiveness of, of, you know, the capital investments to get these plants going. And if those sanctions came down and Russian uranium were to flood the market again, all that investment could be lost. So there is probably a mechanism again for some degree of of uh, government central planning 
to, um, you know, make that a lower risk proposition for private companies to go in and, and let's, build. Let's talk about this. But I think we want to go back. You know, yes, you're totally right about the Russian. There's a real, real, we don't want to right now sanction Russian uh, enriched uranium. I mean, we want to, right. but it's going to be really hard to because the the whole thing is that we don't have the enrichment capacity globally right now to basically absorb a complete uh, in the Western world, uh, in you know, in Europe uh, and and the United States, does not have enough enrichment capacity elsewhere to really be able to survive that building a lot more enrichment capacity. We do not have the ability right now to basically uh, fuel our plants without adding new capacity, right? So what we want to do is we want to not be in the situation where we've cut off ourselves from Russian supply and we don't have the enrichment capacity online and operating. And, you know, I know this is a crazy idea, but nuclear projects sometimes get delayed in construction. Right. So we don't want to be in the situation where we've already cut off our supply and where we, we encounter a delay in building that enrichment plant and not getting it online. So what do you want? What do you do? Well, as you just said, the big concern, if you're an investor in this, is that you're going to build this plant, spend billions of dollars building a, a massive new enrichment facility. And two things are going to happen. One thing could happen. We could suddenly become friends with Russia again. And Russian SWU comes back in the market and floods it and makes it completely uneconomical. Or you have enough people starting to build more enrichment capacity up that you start basically getting a race to the bottom in the price of separative work units, even among the non-Russian players. And right now, the only people who have really risen to the challenge and started building a huge amount of new separative work capacity is the French at that facility in Tricastin, where they're building a couple million more SWU of a centrifuge plant. The only thing the United States has been committed to, uh, the U.S. company in Urenco, has been 750,000 separative work units, right? And we import between three to four million separative work units each year from, um, from Russia. So that's not enough for the U.S. to get off. So what do you do? about this problem. How do we encourage private investment, given that we're not in the United States at least, renationalizing USEC or, or Centris as it's now known? What do we do? Well, there's a really basic uh, um, program that we have. Well, we could, first of all, we could renationalize. We could basically give price support or do something called like an advanced market commitment or an offtake agreement where we basically say, hey, if you build this, the United States government, if you can't find a buyer, will guarantee to basically buy the, you know, separate of work units for a given period of time at a gar guaranteed minimum floor price, which would basically be able to guarantee that if you build that uh, that facility, there'll be a market for it and the investors will know that they'll be able to basically recoup their investment they built in the facility. And that sort of price support program is utilized in the United States all the time. We like to think of ourselves as a super capitalistic society, and we are, but think about the price of milk. Every two weeks, the United States Department of Agriculture, right, puts out a price, a minimum price for class one fluid milk, where they basically say the United States government at, will buy at this price, basically an unlimited quantity of milk, basically if for this guaranteed price. What that basically means is that's the minimum price that liquid milk can ever get at, go at. Because if they ever, if anyone tries to ever sell it for below, they'll just sell it to the USG. Right. And a very similar program of price supports, right, that are used in all sorts of different agricultural commodities in addition to milk is all we really need to be ensure that we mobilize enough private capital, right, to basically ensure that investors will basically mobilize the capital and recoup their investment on these products. Now, there's other ways of doing this. You could make a uranium fuel bank and basically say, we're committing to basically buy 10 years worth of, of fuel, right? Uranium is incredibly dense. So you could literally fuel, you know, have the entire United States worth of uranium fuel and a couple parking lots basically worth of hexafluoride cylinders. There's a huge number of policy, you know, options that we have to solve around that problem that you just identified, Chris. The problem that we have right now is that the United States government and our Department of Energy, despite it being nearly two years after the Ukrainian invasion, has not elucidated 
a clear roadmap of how we are going to get ourselves out of our dependence on Russia. And neither has the nuclear industry on the other side. So right now it looks like we're just sort of planning on relying on Russia for the foreseeable future. Once again, the only, you know, uh, commitments to new capacity that has been put down is about 750,000 or 700,000 separative work units in New Mexico. That is way, way less than how much we take from Russia each year. And, you know, rather than really hearing about solutions to this very pragmatic problem, what I, maybe I'm misinformed, but what I hear a lot about is excitement about, you know, adding separative work units to make HALU for the next generation of U.S. nuclear reactors. That seems like you're not reading the room here. Or I think we were coming up with uh, some kind of a, a culinary or catering metaphor. You might remember it better than I do. But but it, it seems, you know. Yeah, it's like, I think we serve, it's like, you know, serving caviar to uh, during a, a food shortage or something. Yeah, I, maybe yeah. that was what, I don't know. Refugee camp or you something. Know, Who knows? So yeah. But one of the, as I was mentioning before, right, current U.S. light water reactors, actually the global light water reactor fleet right now, basically the high, the, the level of enrichment, we call the fuel that we put into it low enriched uranium. Low enriched uranium is defined as up to 4.95% uranium-235. Now, a lot of advanced reactors like sodium cooled reactors or sodium fast breeder reactors or some even of these micro reactors, they require a lot higher assay concentration of uranium-235, right? They require what's called HALU or high assay low enriched uranium. And that's rather than go up to 4.95% uranium-235, it goes up to 19.75% uranium-235 is what HALU is. The Problem is right now in the United States and actually around the world, there's only one major commercial supplier of HALU. That's once again our friends in Russia. And so the basic problem that we have uh, is a lot of advanced reactor mar- you know, manufacturers are rightly saying, hey, I'm building a reactor right now. That Forget about dependent for a lot of it in Russia. There's basically only one shop in town right now who can basically make my fuel, and that is Russia. And so, therefore, the U.S. government has rightly seen, by the way, this is not wrong, has seen we have to get a domestic HALU supply chain, you know, spun up. But here's the problem. No operating commercial nuclear power plant in the United States right now uses or needs HALU fuel. And so we have spent a huge amount of talk. And, you know, when I hear the DOE, they're talking all about HALU. But they're sort of ignoring the pink elephant in the room, which is the low enriched uranium that's actually used to make 20% or 19% of the United States power every single year. That we currently require a quarter to a third of it comes from Russia. And we don't have a clear roadmap of that. And there's some really interesting things about the way that actually uranium enrichment works, which means that the HALU problem is a lot smaller than the LEU problem. We can go into that if you're interested. No, absolutely. Because uh, from what I understand, um, the feedstock for HALU is low enriched uranium. Low enriched uranium. So tell me about that. How not only, yeah, how how intensive yeah. is How much LEU do you need to make HALU? So let's imagine that you're taking a kilogram. You want a kilogram of uranium of HALU at 19.75% uranium-235. Well, as you just said, what you do is you basically spin up uranium you know, you spin up your uranium hexafluoride in your normal centrifuge cascades, and you get four, you get LEU out of that at 4.95% uranium-235. Next, you feed that LEU, uranium hexafluoride, into a further series of centrifuges, if you're using that technology, to enrich it up to the HALU assay. So you take that 4.95% uranium-235 feed, you run it through your HALU cascade to bring it up to 19.75% uranium-235. But here's the thing, and you can understand this kind of intuitively, right? When we're, you know, basically putting out, you know, when we're trying to find that uranium-235 at the natural uranium level, it's pretty rare. It's about one in 140, 150 atoms are uranium-235. And you think about like M&Ms, right? You know, if you have one in 150 M&Ms are red M&Ms and the rest are green, it takes a lot of work to find a red M&M. But all of a sudden, if one out of every 20 M&Ms are uh, red M&Ms, right? It's much easier, right? And that's the same thing with the separative work that you need to go from that LEU feed to your HALU, right? 
To take that LEU feed, it takes about 36 separative work units, right, to make that LEU feed, right? It only takes around five or six further separative work unit or SWU to take that, that LEU feed and put it, convert it into HALU at 19.75%. So the actual amount of new separative work unit capacity we need to make HALU is very, very tiny compared to the amount that we need to make the LEU that fuels the nuclear reactors that operate today, as well as makes the LEU feed for the HALU feed. So we're kind of focusing on a tiny niche luxury product that is not being used. That's essential, right, for new reactor development. We want new reactor development, but it's not the the major problem that we face today. Okay, so maybe it's like handing out Dior handbags in a refugee camp to take the flour and, and anyway, I'll leave that aside. But so, I so I yeah. mean, that's that's almost a good story that it takes so few, so few SWU to get from LEU to HALU. But how much? LEU is required to make HALU. Like, it seems like you need quite a bit of it. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can go like kilo to kilo. Like, does it take 10 kilos of LEU to make one kilo of, of HALU? Or how, how does that work? <laughs> I was just going to pull up the actual numbers. Oh, oh my God. Like, I found something James Krellenstein doesn't know off the top of his head. No, no. I just don't know the math. I have it in the report. I just don't know the math off my head. Shame, my on, shame on you, James. Shame on yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I'm blanking on it. I don't want to be yelled at by Brett Rand Paul on, on Twitter about getting this, this, this incorrect, right? Uh, um, um, hold on a second. Let me just get these exact numbers. I should have had this up, right? So for that exactly that exact question. So let's think about, we want to make a kilogram. We want to make a kilogram, okay? Uh, um, Chris, of 19.75% uranium-235, Right? So how, how much u- natural uranium do we need to start with? Well, we need to start with 41 kilograms of natural uranium. We need to put that through our LEU enrichment process and spend 35 SWU to basically make 4.5 kilograms of low enriched uranium at 4.95%. And we further need to take that 4.5 kilograms and put just six SWU of separative work in our cascade to make one kilogram of HALU at 19.75% uranium-235. So once again, of the 41 separative work units you need to make that one kilo of HALU, 35 of those SWU are just to make the LEU feed that we need for everything, for regular old-fashioned light water reactors that I love. And we only need about six more of this advanced luxury HALU cascade to take that LEU feed in to make it into HALU. And one of the things that, I'll just be honest, annoys me so much about the Department of Energy when they're talking about that is, like, they're talking about just meaning the HALU demands. But even if we just care about HALU, forget about anything else— most of the SWOO that we need to build is to make the LEU feed. We're ignoring the actual most, the bulk of the uranium enrichment capacity that we need. And that just doesn't make any sense. And what I see where I'm sitting today is that the United States does not have a pathway to get off of Russian dependence. We're hooked on our Russian supply. And that's really bad. We as an industry and as a government need to figure this out because it's ironic that we're spending a billion dollars roughly each year on Russian uranium products while we're spending tens of billions of dollars sending weapons over to Ukraine to basically do this. We're sending, we're writing checks to the same company, Rosatom, that makes Russia's nuclear weapons. And this is a fully solvable problem and we're choosing not to solve it. And the company that uh, runs the occupied, well, I guess Zaporizhia is not running right now, but that uh, occupies it and operates the oper- uh, yeah. operates the non-operating nuclear plant that they've taken over. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a great place. Hey, hey. That's a great place to leave it. It's yeah. poignant. I mean, on the one hand, and I don't want to minimize that this is such a problem, but one billion dollars ain't much compared to yeah, what to what it's what the really Germans nothing. or the the you know, EU nations that were using Russian gas were giving to Gazprom. I'm not. Oh sure. no, no, it's, it's really tiny. It's it's chump change. But it, it doesn't really make a big difference in the Russian economy in any way. It's more of the leverage that Russia has over us. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've and, they've never used and that it's leverage. More of the idea. Of the United States can't 
fucking build like uh, a fucking urane gas centrifuge plant? Like we just need to build the buy the Europeans ones. Yeah. Well, they they make for great landfill. I heard. Uh, <laughs> just keep throwing them at the yeah, desert. There's a lot of. You just go out to the desert and, bar- and unbury some Dig of those up. things. Like, Dig I them mean, up. Pressure the wash them. Billions of dollars that the U.S. government has burnt over the last three decades on this problem, like, is just mind-boggling. The number of centrifuges that are in the desert, right? If we probably put them all together, we could, we would be a much better place than we are. I, you know, it, it could, I, just I just, James, just like on that last point, like they couldn't have just mothballed them and just left them in the. the well, factory. the problem was is that what's the problem? At centrist was going bankrupt. They didn't want to have to keep their NRC license for these contaminated facilities. They wanted to decommission the facility completely and get to a lesser security state and have to not pay. Wow. Centris was like literally worth like a $30 million as a company, right? It, like it went bankrupt. The stock price crashed. It really was in trouble. So, and like, this is the problem with not having a state owned enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave it on that, uh, on that final note. Uh, James, a pleasure. I've learned, uh, you know, a huge amount and, uh, sincerely thank you for, uh, you know, just being such a resource to myself and, and to the community at large. Um, we will post a link to the study that you mentioned was featured in the front page of the New York times. No big deal. Yeah. And, um, uh, I re- listened to it back. I was not as clear as I could have been. I don't know. I, we're not done a yet. Lot of- we're not done yet. Um, so James, thank you. And, uh, we'll see you. See you on our next episode. <laughs> and we're leaving the bloopers in, man. <laughs>